Welcome back everyone, it's me, Matt. Thanks so much for joining me. Today we're tackling a question that rarely gets discussed outside of, well, design offices really, and post-combat analysis. Where should fuel tanks actually be placed on modern tanks and infantry fighting vehicles that are operating in today's battlefield? Now, of course, fuel is essential for armored mobility because they guzzle it. It's also important for operational reach, and it's also very important to protect crews from not being blown up inside of it. Poor fuel placement can turn into a survivable hit, into a fatal one, force crews to abandon the vehicle that were otherwise intact, or create fires that spread faster than any crew can react. So I'm not trying to get into the deep technical understandings of, you know, uh, how and where the placement of fuel tanks should directly go inside of the vehicle, but more the considerations of why and where they go. In modern combat, vehicles are rarely destroyed by a single, clean penetration through heavy armor. Instead, they're often disabled by fires, secondary damage, and, of course, drones. A tank in an IFE does not need to explode to be lost. Modern threats such as top attack munitions, and as I mentioned drones, loitering weapons, and artillery fragments frequently strike areas that were historically considered secondary. These tacks may not penetrate crew armor directly, but they can rupture fuel tanks, sever fuel lines or ignite the vapors, and once the fire enters the vehicle, heat, smoke and toxic fumes can incapacitate the crew very, very quickly. Fuel placement is therefore directly affecting survivability, not by preventing hits of course, but by determining what happens after a hit occurs. And the goal is no longer perfection, the goal is purely damage control. Placing fuel tanks inside armored holes close to the crew has historically been attractive from an engineering standpoint, it simplifies the plumbing, centralizes the mass, and allows for designers to keep the vehicles fairly compact. In some designs, fuel has been integrated into the hull walls, floor spaces, and even the adjacent crew seating. Now, I have to say, looking at the Macava vehicle, they've actually put the fuel tanks at the front, particularly in the Mark II. It's an interesting concept, but they're very different in the way in which they operate for militaries around the world. From a survivability perspective, this approach carries serious risks. Any penetration or fragmentation that breaches the hull could introduce fuel directly spraying into the fighting compartment. Fuel atomizes, vapors ignite, and the fire spreads rapidly. Even if the armor technically holds against the full penetration, spall and partial damage can still rupture the fuel systems. Fires inside the crew compartment is far more dangerous than fire anywhere else in the vehicle. Suppression systems may not be able to react fast enough, and even brief exposure to heat and smoke can force immediate abandonment. The vehicle may still be mechanically repairable, but it's lost tactically at the moment the crew escapes. I've seen firsthand what happens when those systems activate as well, and they're actually just as deadly as putting the fire out. Internal fuel placement prioritizes packaging efficiently over crew survival. In modern battlefield weapons, that trade-off is increasingly difficult to justify. A more, I guess, survivable approach is placing fuel in isolated armored cells along the hull commonly above the tracks behind the armored bulkheads. This keeps fuel outside the crew compartment while still benefiting from the vehicle's main armor mass. When I was in the Warrior 512, I literally slept on top of the fuel tanks. Certainly not ideal if something was to go wrong, and I've been in an accident, road traffic accident in the Warrior when I went upside down, which you can check out, where that fuel actually atomized as it was pouring upside down. Now this layout allows fuel to be separated by structure, armor, and firewalls. If the side hit ruptures a fuel tank, the fire is likely to remain localized, and crews gain precious seconds or minutes instead of losing the vehicle instantly, and self-sealing fuel cells, explosion suppression foam, and compartmentalized plumbing further reduce the chance of catastrophic ignition. Hull side placement does introduce vulnerability, though, to lateral attacks. But modern armor packages already account for this. Side protection has increased significantly due to the prevalence of urban combat and flanking threats. Placing fuel tanks around or within the engine compartment represents one of the most logical, survivable, driven layouts in modern armor design. Hence why the Macava Mark II designed that way. This treats the engine bay as a sacrificial zone, deliberately separating it from the crew by armored bulkheads and structural barriers. The engine absorbs the damage. The automatic fire suppression systems normally can isolate the fire before it spreads forward. Even if the vehicle becomes immobilized, the crew often remains alive and capable of escape or recovery. The design philosophy acknowledges a harsh reality though. Engines are replaceable, crews are not. 
a mobility kill is acceptable, and it prevents a fatality, and this is especially relevant in modern warfare, where vehicle recovery and repair are often possible even if the crew survives the engagement. Engine compartment fuel placement also reduces the risk of vapor accumulation inside the fighting compartment. Fire burns hotter, but more predictably, allowing suppression systems to function a lot more effectively. You can basically place all that foam or all that powder into one environment instead of spreading it to the crew. And as I said, that stuff is deadly. But this approach is not perfect. Rear hits can still disable the vehicle, and the engine bay fires can damage transmission systems. However, the survivability benefit for the crew is pretty significant. When combined with armored bulkheads and modern suppression systems, this layout offers one of the best balances between protection, practicality, and operational realism. Now, external fuel tanks are fairly criticized and often, I think, misunderstood, because they appear exposed and vulnerable, but their purpose and limitations are very frequently misunderstood. External fuel storage is primarily intended to extend operational range during movement, not to be carried directly into combat, although at times they certainly have been, and probably not with the best success rate. When external fuel tanks are struck, they tend to burn dramatically. Flames, smoke, and visible fire create impressions of catastrophic damage. In reality, though, these fires often are quite survivable because they occur outside the crew compartment. Heat and smoke remain external, and the crews can continue operating and disengage safely. That being said, most external fuel tanks are placed on the back of the vehicle, and most modern tanks of today have their engine compartment back there. If the fuel pours into there, it's going to knock out the belts to your fans and all sorts of stuff. Certainly not ideal. But the crew's still safe. The real danger comes when external fuel is retained during combat without the ability to jettison it. Burning fuel can damage optics, external equipment, rear armor if it's not discarded. And for this reason, external tanks are best treated as a consumable, as a logistics aid, rather than a permanent fixture. From a survivability standpoint, external fuel is very preferable to internal fuel near the crew. A vehicle that burns externally may look destroyed, but is preserving the crew. Modern design should emphasize quick release mechanisms, procedural discipline, and clear doctrine regarding when external fuel is used when it's not being discarded. External fuel is not inherently a bad design, but certainly misusing it is. Infantry fighting vehicles face a different set of constraints than main battle tanks, though. They must protect not only the crew, but the dismounted infantry in the back often with lighter armor and tighter internal volumes, which is why it is so difficult to create IFVs of today, because we're asking a lot of them, even more so, I would say, than tanks. Early IFV designs sometimes place fuel inside troop compartments or rear doors, exposing soldiers to extreme risks during rear or side hits. Modern designs have moved away from this, prioritizing separation between fuel and embarked infantry. Front engine layouts do help by placing fuel and mechanical systems forward away from the troops. Fuel tanks are typically located under floors, along hull sides, or outside the troop compartment entirely. Firewalls and suppression systems are essential because if IFVs are more likely to operate in close terrain, they're more likely to really expect a lot of threats that are close to them, such as RPGs or top-down attack, and it doesn't matter where you put the fuel, at some point, 360 degrees, that vehicle is going to get hit. For IFVs, fuel placement is less about withstanding heavy penetrators and more about preventing internal fires during ambushes, drone strikes, and fragmentation damage. Keeping fuel isolated from the soldiers is one of the most important survivability improvements for modern IFVs. I'm sure many of you have watched Pentagon Wars with the Bradley, and let's be honest, it's very hard to design a vehicle that is literally a rolling pile of explosives and fuel. Recent conflicts have reinforced consistent lessons. Vehicles are often lost to fire rather than outright destruction. Drones, top attack weapons, and artillery is a frequent cause of fuel fires. Many of you have been complaining to me about how crews have been left their hatches open on their turrets and dropped just a singular fragmentation grenade in there, not even into the crew compartment sometimes, just the engine compartment, and you're done for. Not due to the explosion, but just due to the flames that it starts and slowly and progressively cooks off the tank. Fire suppression systems, though, really do matter, but they're not magic. Placement and isolation determine whether the suppression even has time to work. Fuel placement has become one of the most important variables, particularly into where you're putting that suppression system. Most of the time, the suppression systems focus on where the fire will start, not where it will lead to. There is no single perfect fuel placement solution, but modern design principles are very clear. 
fuel should never share the same space with crew or embarking infantry. It should be isolated by armor and structure, ideally placed near the engine or in externally armored cells. Fires must be controllable, predictable, and slow enough for suppression systems to fully work. That doesn't mean putting the fire out. It means suppressing it enough to allow the crew to get out. Now, future vehicles may reduce fuel dependency through hybrid propulsion or distributed power systems, but fuel will remain a vulnerability for the foreseeable future. Design success, I think, will certainly be measured by how well vehicles manage damage rather than trying to avoid it entirely. It's inevitable, particularly with you screaming all at the comments about drones, that fire will still be a problem for the foreseeable future. Fuel placement may not be glamorous or super interesting, but I find it quietly decides who's going to survive modern armored combat. Fire is going to be very, very risky for all armored vehicles of today, regardless of how we try and set up the fuel tanks. Folks, if you found this kind of breakdown useful, you enjoyed it, please let me know. As you can see, my face is on screen a lot more today. Maybe you've never seen me before, uh, but this is kind of how I'm going to roll a little bit more with making some of my content because finding B-roll footage is very difficult nowadays, and I still to this day don't have an editor. Uh, everything is done by just yourself, one and only Matt. Uh, so if you're interested in doing some video editing for me or you're good at graphical editing and creating some good B-roll for me to put into my videos, let me know. Um, I, I haven't had great success in finding uh, the best candidates. It's not that these candidates are not best suited. They don't have skills. It's just, unfortunately, I just can't afford them. Um, and I, I don't get, uh, you know millions and millions of subs or views out of this so for you to work with me it's 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 tough um because i can't i can't pay you a lot um, but if you're interested let me know i i certainly don't do this for the money uh if you're willing to be part of my channel too and you want to collab or whatever it may be please let me know because uh, i'm trying to expand and change things up a little bit for the channel here because it's tough uh you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of content out there and i'm trying to Throw a little bit of spice in there to make it feel a little bit more engaging and fun. So thanks again for joining me, folks. I hope you have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.